The River Ebro was where the Spanish Republic's fate was to be sealed. July 28, 1938. In the Ebro Valley, the Republic, now close to desperation, launched its greatest offensive. Much of the Republican army was thrown into the battle, a fight not just for ground, but supremely for time. Juan Negrin, the Prime Minister, knew that European war against Hitler was now close. If only the Republic could hang on, it might be rescued by the anti-fascist allies in that war. The Ebro was the most costly battle of the Civil War, but for the Republicans it came at the end of two years of bitter, unsuccessful fighting. Two years which would transform Republican hopes into memories of failure. Now failure was behind them. The soldiers of the Republic who crossed the river that day were excited to be on the offensive again. This was great that we were crossing the Ebro and going to the other side to have a go at them and push them back. And obviously we were hoping to chase them quite a distance, chase them all together on that front anyway. This optimism defied the experience of two years of defeat. Once again, the popular army was attempting to match the enemy in conventional warfare, which would lead to a battle of attrition in which the Republic stood no chance. The attack across the Ebro was probably doomed before it began. The nationalists now held over two-thirds of Spain. They had split the Republican zone into two. Valencia was under threat. The all-out offensive across the Ebro was meant to ward off this danger. The idea came largely from Juan Negrin, the enigmatic Prime Minister of the Republic, a right-wing socialist and a distinguished professor of medicine. Negrin mirrored many of the contradictions of the Republic. He believed that the only way to fight the war was to halt the revolution and bring the army under disciplined, central control, with himself in command. In this, Negrin was closely supported by the communists. They were tough. They took orders ultimately from Moscow. Their vision of democracy was a world away from Negrin's. Yet he was committed to working with the communists, not least because the Republic needed Soviet aid. Negrin was a subtle, unreadable person. No one knew his real mind. At the same moment that he was secretly initiating peace feelers to Franco, he was also organizing the supreme offensive of the war. At first, the nationalists were taken by surprise. The Republican thrust drove them back in hasty retreat. The hills overlooking the small town of Gandesa, 25 miles inside nationalist territory, now became the new front line. General Franco rushed forward reinforcements pulled out of other battlefronts. In huge, prolonged battles like this, Franco's army had the advantage. It was more mobile and in the nationalist army orders were more efficiently communicated. 
it benefited from German and Italian aid, while the Republic's foreign aid had diminished with the renewed closure of the French border. Determined not to yield another yard of ground, Franco took personal command. The Ebro attack was halted and turned into four months of slogging, static battle, the largest and most savage conflict of the whole war. Hill 666 was one of the Republic's most advanced positions. It became a focus of nationalist counterattacks. Bill Bailey and other international brigaders were helping Spanish Republican troops to defend the hill. And that was one case where we prayed, literally prayed for the darkness to come so we could at least get up and stretch our legs, move around. And the bastards, when nighttime came, they threw more shells at us. And then it was a question of watching blazing rockets uh, blasting in air after it would hit the mountainside, throw tons of rock at you. And it wasn't so much the artillery hitting you, it was down the splinters of rock, splashing all over the place. And I have to say that it was one of my most bitter experiences. And I'll speak truthfully and say that there were many times when I figured I would never get off this rock. In the end, the Republican troops were forced off Hill 666, leaving its slopes littered with their dead. Now began the retreat, a retreat which was only to end with the end of the war. Enrique Lista was a Republican corps commander at the Battle of the Ebro. We found ourselves in a situation where we couldn't give up any of our positions. So it was a battle of attrition in which we were losing our best troops, but we had no choice. By now, there was no choice. Once again, the popular army had attempted to match the enemy in regular combat and failed. Just as it had at Brunetti, Belchite, Teruel, the popular army found it could not defeat the enemy in conventional fighting for defended positions. The Republic had put down the revolution behind its own lines. This meant that the government also avoided revolutionary military tactics. Guerrilla war, invented in Spain as the people's answer to regular armies, was never seriously attempted in the civil war. As it had done before, the popular army fought with courage, but once again, in a battle of attrition, it could not prevail against the superior weight and professionalism of the nationalists. Once again, the Republican forces were hammered into retreat. Behind them, they left vast quantities of precious equipment. Failure in battle hardened Negrin's resolve to save the Republic. One strategy was negotiation. The previous May, he had published a moderate 13-point declaration for victory, in reality a hint that the war could be ended by mediation. Horrified by the sum of death and destruction, Negrin nonetheless remained determined that a democratic Spain should emerge from the ruins. His second strategy pursued the same democratic aims. If peace could not be negotiated, he would fight on in the hope that a greater war between democracy and fascism would explode in Europe, a war which would engulf Spain's own conflict. But Franco would have no compromise. Total victory was within reach. He wanted nothing less. <laughs> It was an ugly paradox for Negrin, that as he saw it, only Hitler, Franco's ally, could save him. For it was Germany's continued expansionism which he hoped would touch off war in Europe. Then Negrin hoped that Britain and France would welcome the Spanish Republic as an ally. In 1936, Hitler had occupied the Rhineland with 
troops. In March 1938, the Germans marched into Austria. Now in September 1938, it was Czechoslovakia's turn. At Munich, the statesmen of Britain and France met Hitler and Mussolini to see if the peace could be saved. For the British and French governments, non-intervention in Spain had been one way of trying to postpone a conflict with Hitler. In spite of the blatant foreign aid to both sides in the Civil War, they were still clinging to this policy. Now came the news of the democracy's pact with Hitler. Once again, the Western democracies had chosen the path of appeasement. While Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, told cheering Londoners that it was peace in our time, Negrin faced the truth. Time was against him. When the Second World War came, it was to be too late to save the Spanish Republic. Munich also lost the Republic, its only effective ally, Stalin. The Soviet leaders decided to change their whole strategy. Munich destroyed Stalin's policy of building an anti-fascist alliance in which the Western democracies would stand together with Russia to block the expansion of Germany and Italy. Now Stalin saw himself isolated. To gain time, he was eventually to sign the Nazi-Soviet pact with Hitler. Now, as his anti-fascist alliance plan collapsed, Stalin's support for the Spanish Republic was abandoned. Hitler must not be provoked. Soviet aid to Spain dwindled. Hitler's policy towards Spain changed too, but in the opposite direction. Realizing nothing he did there would cause Britain and France to go to war, he dramatically increased his aid, now keen to end the Spanish war as quickly as possible. There was a huge increase in German military aid to the nationalists. Franco had sent an urgent request for more weapons to clinch the Battle of the Ebro. In return, he agreed to grant Germany generous mining concessions in Spain, and he promised to pay the costs of the German Condor Legion. But Mussolini decided to reduce his aid to Franco. He accepted the proposal of the Non-Intervention Committee to withdraw foreign volunteers fighting in the Civil War. 10,000 Italians, nearly half the total in Spain, now embarked for home. Those who stayed continued fighting with the Nationalist Army at the Ebro. Negrin also agreed that the foreign volunteers on the Republican side should be withdrawn. He was hoping that non-intervention by foreign powers might at last become a reality. The last grim stages of the Battle of the Ebro were still being fought when, on October 29th, the International Brigaders took their farewell. Barcelona showed their gratitude to these survivors of the 40,000 foreigners who had left their homes to fight for the Spanish Republic. The Passionaria spoke proudly to the crowds. These men reached our country as crusaders for freedom. They gave up everything, their country, home and fortune. Fathers, mothers, wives, brothers, sisters and children and they came and told us, we are here. Your cause, Spain's cause, is ours. It is the cause of all advanced and progressive mankind. The departure of foreigners hardly affected the Republic's fighting strength. 
They had mattered in the first days through their discipline and their message of solidarity, but they had not been militarily decisive. By now, the brigades were mostly manned by Spaniards. Most volunteers went home. Only brigaders from fascist countries had no home to go to. But the war went on. By mid-November, Franco had reconquered the ground he had lost to the Republic in the first two days of the Ebro offensive. Just before Christmas 1938, the nationalists crossed the Ebro into Catalonia. The fresh aid from Germany had arrived and was proving decisive. The nationalist advance was now meeting little resistance. By mid-January 1939, Tarragona had fallen. By the end of January, Franco was nearing Barcelona. The only party utterly united in determination to fight on were the communists. They used much-needed warplanes to shower leaflets on Barcelona, urging the population to continue the struggle. But Negrin was playing a double game. Outwardly, he went along with the communists. He had little choice. In secret, he pursued his search for a negotiated peace. But the whole political fabric of the Republic was beginning to fall apart around Negrin. Many resented his apparent sympathy with a hard communist line. The anarchists, whose dreams of revolution were dead, were still fighting. But they were fighting for a republic they didn't believe in. So were the Catalan nationalists, whose treasured autonomy had been eroded by the government's centralist line. The republic was no longer the republic. The Republic was no longer what it had been. The power of the Catalan government had been wiped out by Negrin, to such an extent that at one point I began to ask myself if I was doing the right thing to continue taking part in the fighting at all. While the communists were trying to boast a public morale, others used their most brutal means to destroy it. For months now, Barcelona had been the target of bombing raids. The previous March, Italian bombers had battered the city in waves that kept coming for 48 hours. The port and the city centre had been particularly badly damaged. The air attacks had continued ever since. But those March raids stayed in Barcelona's memory as the most terrifying. If I tell you that more than half of Barcelona fled to shelter in the hills and woods around Barcelona, you'll understand what the bombings were like. I was assigned to the casualty post in the Calle Sepulveda, and whenever there was a raid, which was about every three hours, we were told where to go to pick up those not seriously wounded. Sometimes, while we were doing this, we were caught by the next bombing, so we had to start all over again. A lot of people from the Red Cross, plus a lot of those whose cars had been commandeered for this, were killed in those attacks. The bombing of Barcelona came after the air raids on Madrid, Durango and Guernica. But the bombing of Barcelona went on for months. Aimed at cowing the civilian population by its destructive power, it generated a sullen hatred. Since the Republican zone had been cut in two, there were fewer refugees coming into Barcelona. Those who did travelled on north as fast as possible. But they had all told the same story. A story of what took place when the nationalists had captured and occupied their villages and towns. A story of death and persecution. The closer the nationalists got to Barcelona, the more these stories terrified the population. By January 24th, 
The nationalists were less than five miles away. In Barcelona, people realized that all was lost, in spite of some talk of setting up a line of resistance. No one believed it, because they really just wanted the whole thing to be over. And you'd hear people say, it doesn't matter how it ends, only let it end soon. I heard that quite often in my neighborhood. It doesn't matter how it ends, only let it end soon. The Catalans joined the refugee torrent. Many struggled up the high mountain passes of the Pyrenees. France meant safety. They traveled by day and night. Barcelona, on the morning of January 26th. From all sides, the nationalist forces moved in. The tanks rumbled down the diagonal. The infantry marched down the slopes above the city. A few communists tried to build barricades. They soon gave up. The fascist soldiers were already coming down the hillside. It was a very sunny day in Barcelona, one of those very radiant days, and the bayonets of their rifles glinted menacingly in the sunlight. That vision was terrifying, but the truth is that they didn't scare us. But we knew we had to run. We ran and ran as fast as we could. We left the cobblestones by the side of the tram lines. Of those who stayed, many now welcomed the nationalist columns led by General Yagüe. For them, it was a joyous moment. The hour of rescue, the end of a revolutionary nightmare. Free to practice their religion openly for the first time in nearly three years, they praised God and Franco for victory. Some of the Catalan middle class were much less certain. Long tired of the war, they must now have feared the future. Often liberals, they had no sympathy for Franco's regime. I knew very well he had none for Catalan autonomy. And the prospect was bleak for communists, anarchists and socialists still in Barcelona. The revenge killings were about to begin. Near the French frontier and the fortress of Figueres, Negrin called a secret meeting of the Cortes. Held at night in the subterranean vaults, this was the last session of the Republican Cortes on Spanish soil. One of the few foreigners present was the British journalist, Willie Forrest. Well, Negrin got up first to speak and started by reading from a prepared text. But uh, as he proceeded, he sort of threw his script aside and started walking up and down and some sort of fire came into his voice. Negrin announced that the 13 points of the government's programme were being cut to three. It was the last point which now mattered most. Franco must give a guarantee, a cast-iron guarantee, that after the war there would be no reprisals by the victors against the vanquished. The victors were now sweeping northwards towards the French border. One week after Negrin left Figueres, they took the town. They were a mere 20 miles away from the frontier. For the Republicans, it was no longer retreat, but flight. Negrin and his ministers left Spain. After them pour the remnants of the Republican army in Catalonia, packed together with half a million refugees. 
5,000 human beings cross the border every hour. On the other side lay only the misery, hunger, and overcrowding of French internment camps. The nationalists reached the last border post and closed it. Catalonia had fallen. For these people, the war was over. But Madrid, and more than a quarter of Spain, was still Republican. Negrín was still Prime Minister. He knew he must go back to Spain to save what could be saved by war or compromise. But Franco had no intention of accepting Negrín's latest peace initiative. He wanted only unconditional surrender. March 1939, Moroccan tribesmen, the Moors, were among the nationalist troops who had been besieging Madrid for over two years. The Moorish trenches had become almost a North African village. To the east, they could see the rooftops of Madrid. In the city itself, nationalist supporters have for two and a half years been trying to live unnoticed. Enrique Meret Magdalena had taken refuge in the Paraguayan embassy. During those two and a bit years, we always spoke in whispers and kept the blinds drawn so nobody would know how many people were inside the one flat. There were between 50 and 60 of us. For the Madrid population, Republicans and secret nationalists alike, hunger was now the worst torment. Even vegetable roots became a precious form of food. People stood all day in queues, ready to buy anything which arrived in the denuded shops. Hunger and sheer exhaustion of wartime life were sapping the will to fight on. Negrín, the Prime Minister, had flown back to Spain. Surrounding himself by communists, whom he promoted to a series of vital military commands, he established himself near Alicante. In what was left of the Republic, there were still four armies adding up to half a million men. The army commander in Madrid, Colonel Casado, believed that Negrín's reliance on the communists was a major stumbling block to winning peace concessions. He had put out his own peace feeders to the nationalists. Now, to back this, he launched what was in effect a coup d'etat in Madrid. Negrín and his colleagues were at dinner near Alicante when they heard Casado attacking them over the radio. Willie Forrest was there. There was a telephone in the dining room and the Green went over to it and asked to be put through to Casado. He had to hang up for a minute and wait, but then the phone rang. The Green went over. It was Casado on the line. What's going on? was the first words that I heard the Green say. I couldn't hear, of course, Casado's replies, but the, from what the Green said afterwards, it was quite clear, because what the Green said was, You've rebelled? Against whom, may I ask? Against me? Then consider yourself relieved of your command. And with that, Negrin slammed down the telephone and, turning to his ministers, he asked them to follow him upstairs for another cabinet meeting. It was to be a crucial night for Prime Minister Negrin, a night that settled his fate and the fate of the Republic. Clearly, Negrin's political position was collapsing. The communist leaders decided not to organize resistance to the Casado coup. Whether this reflected Stalin's current disinterest in Spain and whether this clinched Negrin's decision to flee remain open questions. 
at three in the morning, Willie Forrest watched as Negrin and his government filed out of their last meeting. Well, that, as I said, was the end. We were there, didn't need to be told of the government's decision to quit. We, we saw the ministerial bags being packed. We saw Senior Garthys, the police chief, going through his dossiers and tearing up papers. And we knew that uh, Cisneros, the Air Force chief, had gone off in great haste to a, an airfield about 20, at Monova, about 20 miles from where we were, to organize a couple of planes for the government's escape. As Negrin left Spain for the last time, chaotic shooting broke out inside Madrid. Casado's supporters fought communist units who did not know or couldn't believe that their leaders had decided not to resist the Casado coup. Once again, the Republic was tearing itself apart. For two weeks, Casado attempted to negotiate an honorable peace. His efforts were to prove as vain as Negrin's. Franco broke off contact with him. Casado now had no choice. He ordered the Republican armies to raise the white flag and surrender. The nationalists, in the end, never had to fight to capture Madrid. Unopposed, they walked in. I woke up and I heard shouts and I thought somebody's gone mad and now we're going to be in real trouble, just when the war is about to finish. And then I came out and I heard shouts, Viva España, Viva España. And I said, what are you shouting for? You've all gone crazy. They replied, no, no, Madrid has been liberated. The war is over. And then we all jumped from the balcony into the street. I took my brother with me and we went out to see what was happening in the streets. I reckon that even some of those who'd taken part in the events of the 14th of April 1931 were now the ones who climbed onto lorries. I think they were more or less the same people. Or at least, there were just as many of them and they were equally enthusiastic. As Franco's soldiers trudged into the streets of Madrid, Palanque's supporters poured out of hiding. Republicans, trying to escape from nationalist vengeance, headed for the port of Alicante on the southeastern coast, chosen as the main evacuation point. On March 28th, as Madrid fell, this British ship left Alicante. On board were some 500 Republicans, mostly leading figures. Left behind were about 20,000 refugees who were swarming into the harbour area, hoping desperately for ships to rescue them. For these three survivors, Natiso Julian, Eduardo de Guzman, and his sister-in-law, Encarnación Bueno, what followed is an indelible memory. Well, we were looking out towards the horizon. We could see a few lights. Some people were saying that they were our boats, that they were getting nearer. This was the worst torture of the harbour, the torment of hope thinking we were going to be saved when there was no salvation possible. I remember every single moment. Each was more terrible than the one before. Every minute that passed without the boats arriving made me believe less and less in boats, in anything. My son was saying, you'll see, Mum, you'll see, we'll get away. But when the hours passed and no boats came near, I stopped believing in anything. By March 30th, Italian troops had occupied the fortress overlooking the harbour. The Republicans crowded along this quay were at their mercy. The last boats had gone. Now there was no hope, only fear. I was sitting there, my son next to me, we were talking. We knew already that the boats were not coming. Along came a man of about 40, strong, good-looking, a man who looked in really good health. He came quite close to me. I didn't realize what was happening. I heard a shot. He'd shot himself and fallen down right there. I totally lost my calm then. 
My son was saying, don't be frightened, mother. Don't be scared. You'll see a lot more of this here, but don't be frightened. But of course, I was scared stiff. I don't know what I thought. Perhaps that they would bring out machine guns and finish us all off. Nationalist troops moved into Alicante to reinforce the Italians. The helpless masses in the harbour knew that they would be rounded up the following day. For the anarchists amongst them, one question remained to be settled in the last hours of liberty. And we spent the whole night discussing what we should do from a revolutionary viewpoint, without giving ourselves any false illusions about escaping death. But what was the best thing for the cause we had all defended? Should we give ourselves up or kill ourselves? This was the last minute dilemma, what we were debating that last night. These were the two points of view. Emil said, this was a comrade called Mario Emil, he said, I'm not sparing them any crimes. If they want me dead, they'll have to kill me. Nobody on the quayside slept that night. Through the darkness of March 31st, this macabre debate was argued to its conclusion. Many agreed with Guthman's friend to stay alive and let the enemy take the ultimate guilt. But others made suicide pacts. Eduardo de Guthman recalls the last two to die. After that last discussion, when we were about to leave, they took each other by the hand and saying, this is our last protest against fascism, they raised their pistols to each other's heads and shot each other. As we were leaving the port, somebody said, we'll soon be envying the dead. And I thought, no, we'd better start envying them now. Few today remember that Alicante port was the place of the Republic's last agony. Nearly three years after the army insurrection, the war was over. The guns fell silent. The church bells began to ring. Over the radio, a nationalist announcer delivered Franco's final war communique. En el día de hoy, cautivo y desarmado el ejército rojo, han alcanzado las tropas nacionales sus últimos objetivos militares. La guerra ha terminado. Burgos, primero de abril de 1939, año de la victoria. El generalísimo Franco. April 2nd, 1939, the day after the war's official end, was Palm Sunday. In Madrid, Generalissimo Franco went to lay a sword of victory in the Church of Santa Barbara. It was the first of many triumphal occasions in which Franco and Spain celebrated the nationalist victory. Would Spain be like under Franco? The fighting was over, but the so-called national crusade had a long way to run. Spain was to be transformed, but into an image of the past. Out of the turmoil of the Republic, the Spain of history was to be resurrected, ruled once more by the church, the oligarchy, the great landowners. There was to be a fatherland at once new and ancient, a nation united, obedient, purged of evil. Franco decreed, retroactively, that all who had opposed the nationalists would be answerable. Even pre-war political opponents were not to be spared. He saw the main threat in the working class, once triumphant, now prostrate. Here, the purge must be most harsh. It began at once, among the new hordes of his captives. Nobody suspected of Republican sympathies was safe. Concentration camps all over Spain were swamped by hundreds of thousands of prisoners. 
the captives from the harbour at Alicante were brought here, to this barren place, which was then the concentration camp of Albatera. It is said that Franco personally ordered that there should be no photographs of the camp. When it had served its purpose, every trace of it was cleared away. All that remains today is an old hut used by the guards and a path once trodden by 30,000 arriving prisoners. But the camp can never be clear from the memories of those who survived Albatera. The repression began right from the start. We were never considered human beings. That's the way it was under Franco. We were always considered as things, never as human beings. Albatera was not just an internment camp. It was also a camp where people awaited selection for execution. Through the gate which used to stand here, the visitors arrived. These were the moments of terror, for these visitors were members of the Falanque, who came to identify their enemies. They were looking for people from their towns, or anyone else of note, anyone who'd been a volunteer or fought in the Republican army, or anyone who'd been mayor or any other official in any Republican town in Spain. And they picked these people out right there and then. This one, this one, this one. And without more ado, just took them off. They took them away to their respective villages. Most of the time, these prisoners never reached their destination. What usually happened was that we heard the shots from here, and that was the end of them. There were also executions within the camp. The prisoners were forced to watch them. I remember the first executions. I'd been locked up in the punishment area. So there were three lads that they shot. They'd lined us up at machine gun point. And one of the lads, a commissar, said to everyone, keep calm, comrades, don't make a move. They'll use it as an excuse to kill us all. And they shot him right there in front of us. Nobody knows how many of the 30,000 who went into Albatera perished by execution or just callous neglect. Most people know what the Nazi extermination camps were like. They've seen films of them. I think that the Albatera camp was in many ways like those extermination camps, except it was less systematic. Everything here was less organized. In the concentration camps, persecution was still haphazard. But soon, the policy of systematic repression began. The prison population increased by over 200,000 people. There were token trials, rapid sentences, executions. The terror lasted at this pitch for more than four years, longer than the war itself. Many, like Narciso Julian and Eduardo de Guzman, suffered for much longer. Both were sentenced to death. Eduardo de Guzman spent nine years in prison. He and Narciso Julian, like many others, waited to be executed for over a year, never knowing if the next day was to be their last. Narciso Julian was to spend 25 years in prison. This part of the prison yard, the Jetha Rias, still holds special memories for him. In 1945, he met his daughter there. In 1965, 20 years later, he met his granddaughter in the same spot. But for nationalist families, the suppression of all dissent meant unity. Tomas Garicano Gonye, later one of Franco's ministers, found a solid logic in Franco's persecutions. The repression was aimed at preventing any possible reaction from any communists or socialists still at liberty in Spain or living abroad in exile, in case they returned to Spain, to turn the situation on its heels and take power again. As the corpse of Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera was carried from Alicante to Madrid, Republican supporters in villages along the road were shot 
without even the hearing the 15th century Inquisition had given its victims. Franco was hammering Spain into a political monolith without opposition. The Falanque, which had stood for a revolutionary fascism, had already been forcibly integrated into an ultra-conservative one-party state. But the dead Jose Antonio, the charismatic leader of the Falanque executed by the Republicans, was now appointed patron saint and martyr of the new Spain. Francisco Franco, El Caudillo, could safely share the leadership of Spain with a dead man who could not contradict the myth imposed on him. All other political movements were forbidden. Regional autonomy and diversity were obliterated. Such was Franco's version of national unity, and many in the Spanish middle class greeted it with rapture. Las procesiones in aquellos momentos tenían un auge fenomenal. There was an extraordinary boom in processions, Holy Week processions and processions for just about every saint. They were packed with people marching along. There was a revival of all this sort of thing that had disappeared under the Republic. These things seemed important to us then. They gave us the impression of recovering something that we had lost. Los valores eh, religiosos, los valores patrióticos. The religious values, no, patriotic values, todo eso, the values of order, all these were restored. Que las libertades, pero lógicamente los que teníamos una vida... There was an absence pues, of freedom, but logically those of us that had well-ordered lives... Y, those of us who were professionals no and saw things from the personal viewpoint only, pues we felt very much at ease and happy. Y In this ruined Spain, the first years of peace were even harder in their way than the war. The country lost hundreds of thousands of refugees who were forced to remain in exile. And in Spain, to the physical destruction were added famine, mass unemployment, impoverishment. Many thousands died of starvation. Thousands more were shot. For there was no magnanimity in Franco, no gift of reconciliation. And nationalists everywhere at every level became infected with their leader's lust for revenge. What happened in masterless matters happened throughout Spain. The Molinaire family had worked this plot of land for many years. Juan Molinaire was a young man in 1938. He and his family were socialists. When the nationalists swept into Aragon, they had fled with other refugees towards Valencia. And when the war finished, Franco said we shouldn't be afraid to return to our villages. And of course, since we weren't guilty of anything, we came back. When we arrived here, they arrested us. They wouldn't even let us out of jail. Molinaire's father was imprisoned by the local Falanque, who now control masterless matters. Juan was never to see his father again. Forty years later, the memory of his death still pains him. Of course I remember. Those were very critical moments, crucial moments. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And on top of it all, one has to live with those people, knowing that they had killed him. But you had to go on living with them without saying a word.
After every civil war, hatred is the real survivor. Stifled behind closed doors, hidden in neighbors who avert their faces on the village street, the poison trickles down the years. So it was in Spain, where almost every family had a hatred to nurse. And yet, as time passed, locked minds began timidly to open again. As my children grew up, they used to chide me because I'd been a Franco supporter. Mum, how on earth could you support Franco? I think that he saved us. How can you say that? Then they began bringing me books and books and more books, and I started to realize that it had been terrible, and that there had been as many monstrosities on this side as there had been on the other side, because I already knew about the other side. But I didn't know what had happened here. And so, gradually, you evolve, and you realize that there is neither good nor evil, as they used to tell you, that you can think for yourself, that something you do not like, someone else may think is fine, that you are in no position to judge others, that someone can think one way while you think another, and he could be just as good a person as you. That is what my children taught me.